Cool. All right. So the red light is on. That means we're rolling and we're recording. So uh, for those who are watching and listening, thank you very much for uh, tuning in. Uh, as you know, I've, I do interviews. I like to talk with people. I like to learn things. But uh, in a, a recent project that uh, was completed with a new CD that I put out, um, I met some people and made new friends in the music world because that was my uh, my gig before being a trainer and rehabilitation specialist and all that. And, you know, since that project, I've really uh, been drawn more back into looking at music differently. Of course, I am speaking about this CD right here. <laughs> Fantastic. I'm very proud of that CD. Oh, That's man, great. I love it. So my, my guest is a person who actually I, I started... Jeff, man. First of all, my guest is Jeff Richmond. He's become a good friend. He's um, uh, somebody who I've gotten to know over the past almost two years. And uh, right now we're in April 2020. And uh, it's kind of a story how that happened. And we can get to that. But you know, my friend, yeah, I've been listening to you since the early uh, mid 1990s at the latest. But I think it was sooner than that. And then, of course, when YouTube became a thing. I'm on it, man. And I'm watching all Jeff Richmond videos. And I'm, you know, besides being a musical influence and hero to me, you're working with all my heroes. And here we are. We're having a conversation now. And we put out a CD. So welcome. Yeah. Welcome. Yeah. Thanks. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's been totally so cool to know you and meet you and to hang out with you and to continue our relationship. It's really cool. It's been a, a great experience. and. Um, I wish when I was out there recording, I had more time to hang out. And at some point, I'll get back out and we'll hang out again. But yes. um, so for those who are uh, watching and listening, you may already know about Jeff. He's put out a lot of CDs over the years, and this is just a few of them. Um, I'm just kind of holding them up. There's a whole, <laughs> there's a whole lot of them. I love it. Um, great, great stuff. But... You've been playing guitar a long time. You've been doing the gigging for and, and putting out some great stuff. And you have, uh, you know, when we were hanging out and talking the f anytime we did, even on the phone, I love hearing some of the stories about, uh, first of all, who you've been to see, you know, concerts you've seen, because you've seen a lot, uh -huh. and who you've worked with. And you've worked with so many people who are, uh, it's, it's so cool. I'd love to hear some, just what it's been, what has it been like for you? Um, and where did you start? You, when did you start guitar? I actually started when I was 13 in summer camp. I lived in LA as a little, as a kid. And I went to summer camp and I played, I met a guy there who actually, I, I'm, you know, it was when I was 13, but he was from, I live in Granada Hills and he was from Granada Hills. That's kind oh. of interesting. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. World. But anyway, I met this this kid, and we we were both kids in summer camp, and we learned pipeline, okay, know, surf music, and and uh, wipeout. Oh yeah, yeah. And you know, the Ventures were such a great band because there was there was they were all instrumental guitar. You know, it was really cool. And, and you know, then I, I you know I got in when I was you know thirteen, fourteen. I, I um. There was all these TV shows and LA was, you know, where, where Sunset Boulevard was, all these bands played. And I remember one time me and a friend of mine were walking around Hollywood and we saw Herman's Hermits being filmed at CBS, like on oh, the ground there. Really? We, we saw the real Herman's Hermits there. Oh. We were very close. Stuff like that, you know, so I was sort of in, in, in the LA scene, but I was a kid. And then when I was a little older, not much older, like, uh, like the eighth grade, so not... I don't know, maybe 15, I moved to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And and you'd think Hawaii was just, um, you know, just a place that has beaches, which it does. But for some reason, when I was living in Hawaii in high school and a little bit in college, all these bands came through. I, I don't get it. And I saw Hendrix three times. I saw him three times. Jimi Jimmy Hendrix? <laughs> I saw Led Zeppelin. I saw Jethro Tull, Steppenwolf, you know, all these Whoa. bands. Uh, you know, came Jeez. through Hawaii. Mm -hmm. So, and, and you know, when I saw Led Zeppelin, it was before anybody really knew Led Zeppelin. In fact, 
I was going to the beach, going to go body surfing in my car when I was 16. And on the radio, I heard, boom, boom, da, 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 you know, that Zeppelin. I went, what is this? Yeah. <laughs> and I came around, I made a U-turn and went right to the record store. The record was for sale. And I went home and listened to it, you know, and it was like, it blew my mind. Wow. It's, it's same with Hendrix. Um, you know, loved it. And, and so, so anyway, I got to see some really good acts that came to Hawaii and they really influenced me. And then I went to Berklee College of Music. Mm -hmm. And when I went to Berklee College of Music, there was a couple of nightclubs that were, there were two nightclubs in one. And so every week there would be two acts playing at, one was called the Jazz Workshop, the other was called Paul's Mall. Oh. And there'd be, I saw everybody. I saw like the Weather Report, Miles Davis, Bill Evans, the Brecker Brothers, um, Ornette oh, Coleman, Charlie Mingus, Keith Jarrett. So many acts, because every week there was some act playing. Mm -hmm. And That's then I moved to New York, you know. Okay, yep. You saw a lot of people in New York, and then I moved to LA. So, so I've been, I wrote down a list of all the, most of the concerts I remember being at, there's, you know, hundreds. So, and they're very influential. Some of those times, you know, some of oh. those. I'm sure. What what are some of your um, your favorites or top of the list that you've been to that you'll just never forget? Well, let me think. I'll never forget Led Zeppelin and Jimi Hendrix. Yeah, right. That's um, big. I'll never forget Weather Report because I di I didn't know what they were doing. I couldn't tell what they were doing. All I know is it sounded incredible. Who? What was the lineup in the band that first time? I saw, well, the first time I saw Weather Report was with Miroslav Vitas. Really? And oh. Dom, Dom Mao, Eric Ravat. Oh, wow. Joe Zawinul and Wayne Shorter. Then the next time I saw them was with Alfonso Johnson. Who lives near you? Who lives down the street from me. Who I'm <laughs> from. And yeah, then, wow. And then cool. I saw them a couple times with Jocko and yeah. Pete Erskine. And then I also saw them with Victor, uh, Victor Bailey. Bailey and Omar Hakim. Yep. I've seen them a lot, but, but, and then of course, Miles Davis. Right. There was one time when I was sitting uh, in the front row and uh, Miles was just right there. And, and he, it was funny. He, something was messing around with, something was wrong with his Wawa pedal and he bent down to fix it. And then he looked up and he was like, like, one and a half feet away from my face. And he looked oh. at me and he went, ah. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, man, that's, that's a, imagine that. That's just, that's really cool. Then, then you know, when I, went, when I was in Boston at Berkeley, Gary Burton was a big deal and Pat Metheny played, he was one of my teachers. Mm. And Pat Metheny played with Gary Burton, with Mick Goodrick, two guitars, and that was really cool. Oh, yeah. I don't know. That, that, that's just some, just a, a little inkling of some of the stuff that was influential. There's a lot of others too. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Uh, so I'm trying to think. I saw, you know, I saw Miles twice when it was in the 80s and it was uh, large venues. So I couldn't get up close. Yeah, I saw him at Grand Park in Chicago with Mike Stern, uh, Marcus Miller, Al Foster. And Sina Minu, Minu on percussion. Yeah, that, that was a great uh, band. That was one of my favorite bands of his, yeah. Yeah, I really enjoyed that show. Um, that was Grand Park, Chicago. The next time was in Syracuse at a, a, a theater here. It was you know, one of our larger ones. You know, Mike so, Stern was a really good friend of mine. Yeah. We kind of followed him. You know, I was a big, he always was a big fan of his. And when he got the gig with Miles Davis, I transcribed his solo on the first song. He played on, um, he played on a song called Fat Time, which was yes. the first album that got released after Miles did this self-imposed retirement. And I transcribed his solo and I got it published in Downbeat. Oh, really? That's cool. Yeah, yeah that was cool. So that was, uh, I think that might've been The Man With The Horn or no. Man that with was, the Horn. Was it the double album like that? No, yeah, the, 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 the next one, was the album after The Man With The Horn was called We Want Miles, and that was a yellow album. That's right, a yellow double album. 
Man with the horn. I remember that. I remember actually the the logo now too. The the, the, the man with the horn was the first. The Fat Time was the first song. Yes. Yeah. I I don't remember who played guitar when I saw Miles the second time, but the band was different, and it was really great. It was uh, that uh, Daryl Jones on bass. Uh, the nephew's Miles. Uh, Miles. Miles' nephew. I'm sorry. It will be. Yes, yeah, he and he he's great. Um, I don't know who's on guitar. I I want to say it could have been Robin Ford, but I, I don't think it was Robin Ford, and it wasn't Schofield, so I don't know who it was. He was a guy named Foley. He played like kind of a bass guitar, like a piccolo bass or something. Yeah, I don't remember, but uh, it was that was a fun show because it was a uh, smaller venue, but still I couldn't get up close or anything. But it was good. It was good, and then Weather Report. I just saw them. I saw, I saw them with Jocko, Peter, Bobby Thomas. Um, do you know Bobby? I met him a long time ago, but I don't really know. Um, he's a nice guy. I mean, we haven't talked yet. We've been messaging a lot because uh, I'm not even sure how that happened. But I was looking for my bongos because we might do a Zoom duet, <laughs> record it and post it. You should do it. It was like so funny because here it is, you know, it's 1979 or, or 80. I was 19 years old, max. I'm 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 up. I'm watching Zolano, Shorter, Erskine, Jocko, and I've never seen Jocko before. And I'm dying. I'm thinking these these are the gods, right? And there's Bobby mm -hmm. Thomas, another god. If he's with them, he has to be a, a musical god. And now we're like texting and stuff. It's just almost surreal. Yeah, but the gods are also people, you know. Um, I yeah. think that's that a lot of people lose track of is that humans, you know, you have to go through life, wake up in the morning, uh, brush your teeth, take a shower. Yeah, we're all the same. Health issues sometimes, you know. So, yeah, it's it is interesting to be talking with him a little. Um, but also, uh, I saw them with the Omar and Victor Bailey lineup. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, there was there was actually. When I saw that lineup, there's a song called D Flat Waltz. Oh, I love that song. And I, I, I love that song too. And, I, and um, I loved it so much that that night after the concert, I basically ripped off the concept of D Flat Waltz in a way. Like a, a, the form, it has a little groove and has a middle section, then it has a stronger groove. So yeah. I wrote my, old, my own song. But it, D flat waltz is in three four. My song was called Bamboo Man, and it was in four four. And it, it, you know, when it was done, it really didn't sound anything like D flat waltz. It sounded like my tune, but it was influenced by D flat waltz. So the funny thing is, I was friends with Weather Report's management at the time. Mm -hmm. They were they were a couple, and they lived in, near where I lived, and I'd always hang, ride my bike there and just sit at the office with them. Mm -hmm. So one day they came into my gig without telling me, and they brought Joe Zolino. Oh, really? <laughs> so the two of them were sitting there, and Joe Zion was sitting there. And I was nervous as, as all get out. <laughs> we played that song, Bamboo Man. Yeah. Right? So when we finished, he talked to me. He said, man, I really dug that tune, man. That's a great tune. Wow. And See? I, said, I stole it from you, man. I told <laughs> it, and he goes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I only met Joe a couple times for, like, you know, a minute, but I, from the stories I've heard and from what I've seen, I, I can see him saying that, you know? Yeah, he was, yeah. Really, he was really nice. That's cool. That's cool. Jimmy and Scott have told me some Joe stories and Peter, of course. Uh, so then there was another version of the band after Wayne was out. It was Steve Kahn on guitar. Did you ever see that, that group? I, did, Weather, I, did, I didn't see that, no. Weather Update. Weather Update. And so there was Domino Syndicate. Right, yeah, that came after, right? So I think Weather Update had Bobby Thomas too, and it was Steve Kahn, Peter, and Joe. Mm -hmm. Victor Bailey, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, that was fun. That was, that, was a, that was fun to see. And I got to actually hang out with Steve Kahn for quite a, like an hour that night in the hotel lobby. He was a really nice guy. Never seen him really, before really, or since, but. Really nice. Yeah, nice guy. Well, so he's in New, he's in New York still, I think. Um, Yes. Let's let's go back for a minute because I know when we were hanging out, you were telling me how uh, 
uh, much you enjoyed a lot of the New York scene at that time. You know, you had Sanborn, Hiram, the Brecker brothers. Um, I mean, they were touring all the time, but still Sanborn and Hiram were doing, they playing clubs in New York? There was one club and, and it was called Mikkel's and it was on 97th in Columbus. It's no longer there. There's a Whole Foods there now. Okay. And there's actually a little placard in Whole Foods that said, this used to be Mikkel's. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Cool. And um, Dave Sanborn and Hiram. And Hiram was my favorite guitar player in New York because he oh. was just um, he was just wild. And he reminded me a little bit of Jimi Hendrix. And he, in his solos, he incorporated, you know, jazz, rock, R&B. He was so, like, versatile and all those things. And I remember it was one time when he, when he came, when I, before I moved to New York, I lived in Boston when I was going to Berkeley College of Music. And I met Hiram to make certain. And Hiram actually spent the night at my house one night. And, you know, I, I was living with um, my girlfriend at the time. And we fell asleep. And all, all night long, all I did was hear him play. Didn't sleep at all. He just <laughs> practiced all night long. Oh, wow, man. Really but, but anyway, yeah, I loved Hiram. I loved Dave Sanborn. He played at McHale's. And then I got a gig with Ray Barreto, a famous conga player. Oh, I love Ray. Yeah. Uh, I love him. We, we used to play at McHale's all the time, too. Wow. So it was really cool. It was a whole scene there. You know, everybody would show up and play. And also, McHale's, you, you played till about 3.30 in the morning. Oh, really? That's, that's cool. Really late night hang. Back in the day, right? Back in the day. Back then. Not, back, yeah. back then. So what, what period of time were you with Ray Barreto, approximately? 1970. 1976. And, okay, and there's, I, an, there's an interesting story with Ray, actually. Yeah. I, I played with him. With the guitar player before me was this guy named Barry Finnerty. Oh, I, yeah. He's up in uh, San Francisco, the Bay yeah. now. Yeah, and he was, he was a great guitar player, and I really liked him a lot. I mean, he had a little quirky personality, and everybody didn't really like him that much, but I totally dug him. I, I totally got him. Yeah. Oh, I love Barry. He's great. And also, also, I was really impressed with his guitar playing. He was so fluid and had such great chops. And I didn't. You know, I was just like, <laughs> not like that at all. So I got the gig to, Gil Goldstein was a friend of mine back then. Okay. And, and he was playing with Ray too. And he recommended me and I got the gig with Ray. And I was playing with Ray, you know, a lot. And then uh, uh, about six, seven, eight months into it, we went on a tour of the West Coast, and then we played in Washington, D.C., and we were uh -huh. going to do a couple more gigs and then an album. And then I started hearing rumors that I was going to get fired. Uh -huh. Okay. To some of the band, Ray must have spoken to some of the band members and said, yeah, I'm going to fire Jeff or something. And I was getting really paranoid, you know what I mean? Sure, yeah. So after we played in Washington, D.C., we went back up to New York and Ray called a band meeting and, and we used to rehearse at this place on 33rd and about 7th Avenue, a loft. And he called all of us together and we made a circle around Ray. And he said, okay, we have a bunch of really heavy stuff happening right now. We've got a two week tour of the West Coast. We're coming back to New York. We're going to play at the Playboy Club and then we're going to record an album. So this is really serious, and I'm going to I'm going to pin, I'm going to tell everybody what I don't like about them. <laughs> okay. So he, said, he said, Jeff, you know, I was first. Mm -hmm. So it led me led me to believe that I was the reason for this meeting. You know what I mean? But he was yeah. kind of very benevolent in his approach, and this is what I remembered that he kind of included everybody. But he went to me first, and he goes, "Okay, I had this volume pedal." You know, and the volume, it brings the end of the volume in and out. You know, it was sort of like, I, I grew up, I was in Hawaii. It sort of sounded a little bit like Hawaiian guitar. But it was influenced by Larry Carlton, because Larry Carlton at the time just broke, broke through, and he was really popular, and he used, and Robin Ford, and both those guys used volume pedal, you know, if you remember, like, some of the Joni Mitchell albums. or Absolutely, Steely. yeah, yeah. So he goes, I hate that volume pedal. It sounds like Hawaiian music. Throw it out. He used a lot of expl expletives. You know, and saying, throw that, uh, I can't stand it. And I thought, yeah, no problem. <laughs> you know? and, he goes, and then he goes, what else I don't like is um, 
It's not that you play uh, fast, but you play too many notes, meaning just make some phrases in your playing. I guess I was just like playing and playing and playing. I wasn't stopping to breathe. And he goes, I just want to hear some breath. Oh. I, said, I said, okay. And then the third thing he said was, when you play, if there's some chord changes, I want to hear the changes in your solo. And I thought, wow, cool. I'll do that. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I said, thank you for telling me this. I mean, I will definitely do all those three things. The things are doable. Yeah. And then he went to like the saxophone player, who was Todd Anderson, and he said something like, I love everything about you, except when you don't play, you look like a schlub sitting there. Do something. <laughs> you know. So he went to everybody and he told them stuff. But, you know, I really took it to heart and I was very grateful because, you know, most guys who are leaders like that and old time, old school guys, they just fire you, you know. Yeah. But the thing that I realized, the reason why he didn't fire me was this, was because I wrote five tunes for Ray. Oh. And he really liked those songs. Oh, cool. And he was planning on recording them. Mm -hmm. So he thought, if I get rid of Jeff, then I'll get rid of his songs too, and I don't want to get rid of his songs. So mm -hmm. that, that was really my way in with him. And then the other thing, the final thing I want to say about it is, from that moment on, when I played with Ray, I played for Ray. Okay. Remember that he was always sitting in front of me, and when I play, I kind of look at him, close my eyes or whatever, and play, do exactly what he wanted me to do. And after every solo, he turned around and went, yeah! You know, oh, that's cool, man. That's a great so story. Everything worked out. I got into the recording studio. I took five solos, and four of my tunes got on the album. Wow, that's a, which album is that? It's called "Can You Feel It." I think I have that actually. I think I have it on vinyl because yeah, just I think it uh, only came out on vinyl. Mm hmm. I think it only came out on vinyl. Okay, yeah. Um, I'm sure I have that because I grew up in a house where. It's basically two kinds of music. Big band, like Willie Herman, Maynard Ferguson, Stan Kenton, Buddy Rich, Louis Belson, big bands. And, and, and then, of course, one night we were out, and uh, I remember, did you ever know the Baron, John Von Olin, the drummer? No. Uh, so the Baron, they called him, and I'm not sure why. He just passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. He was Stan Kenton's drummer for quite some time. And then Peter Erskine came in right after when Peter was like 18. Okay. So when I was 10 years old, I saw Stan at this little, this little restaurant. And they packed like 15, 16 guys, 17 guys into this little space two years in a row. First year is the Baron playing, second year is Peter. That's where I got to meet Peter. But the first year, uh, Stan came over to our table because we were right, like Stan was... If you stood up and reached over, you could play the low notes on his piano. That's how close we were. And uh, he was a tall guy. It was like God came over to the table to talk with my parents and me. Wow, <laughs> and my dad said to at some point, he says, what's your favorite music? Who's your favorite musician? Uh, he says, Tito Puente. Uh, he says, you listen to Tito, then you must listen to Tito Rodriguez, and you must listen to Ray Barreto, and listen uh, to all of them. And so that was my introduction when I was around 10 or 11 to Ray. Uh, okay, and I only okay. saw the band once in 82 or 3 in Chicago at, at Grant Park. Uh, but I, I know I have Can You Feel It on vinyl, because... Well, you know, he was going into more of a fusion direction then. He was known for salsa, and yes. so he, he sort of changed directions. Well, it was interesting because when I, when I saw him at that concert, uh, I'd never seen a, a salsa band. I didn't know that there's like no drum set usually in a real authentic situation. And there was no drum set on the stage with Ray's band that night. I was... Wow. Actually, at first I was disappointed and then I was really happy because uh, it, it sounded... It, it was so great. Um, well, you know, he, he had a real... He was, he was just a conga player, you know what I mean? But he had a real talent in selecting musicians. He had a really good yeah. ear, ear and he, he, could, he knew when somebody was, would, could help him, you know, uh -huh. kind of like how Miles was. Miles picked out certain guys that shaped his band, you know, Wayne Shorter, Herbie uh -huh. Hancock, everything, all the way down the line. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, that's so interesting he was a about- band leader. He, Ray was a really good band leader. That's really cool. It's, it's nice to hear that story too, because 
I really, I've, I've enjoyed his music for a long, long time. Well, it's a great story and someone who, who really had a heart and soul and, 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 he, and it worked out for me with him really well because all good, it's not always good stories, you know what I mean? There's, in the music business, it's not all roses and... Well, you, you've told me some of the other stories. <laughs> yeah, there's probably a couple other stories. I know a couple. I won't say anything, but I know a couple. It's actually when I hear some of the other stuff, it kind of blows my mind how people can be. Like, well, I just... remember a long time ago there was a club that I used to play at, and, and before me there was a panel, I remember one time, of people that were successful songwriters, pop songwriters, and the stories they told you about how close they got to having a cut on an album, and it just felt, you know, there's so many horror stories, you know. Yeah. In general. Yeah, yeah. So a good story is really nice to hear. Yeah, so you were in New York. You were New York based during the Barreto years when you were with him, right? Yes. When did you go to LA? Was that your next stop, was LA? I went to LA because I, it's, it's kind of an interesting story. I, I, another story, a good one. I, um, I was really a fan of George Duke back then. Oh, yeah. Because, because he was so versatile and you couldn't label him. He was into fusion, he was into R&B, he was into Brazilian music, you know. It was, he played with Zappa. I mean, he was so, like, interesting. And on his records, he had all this variety. Until later, he started getting more R&B oriented. But back then, and there was a band, I don't think it was a very long-lived band, but it was with Alfonso again and John Schofield and uh, and Billy Cobham. Yes. Well, the George Duke Billy Cobham band. I think. Yes, yeah. And so I read in the Downbeat magazine an interview with George Duke, and it said, I'm putting a band together with Ndugu and a bass player named Byron Miller and a guitar player that I don't know who it is yet, and, and so on. So I said, he doesn't know who it is. <laughs> I, called John, I called John Schofield, and I said, do you know if he's what's happening with the guitar chair? He goes, I don't know, but here's his number. Call him. Oh wow, that's cool. <laughs> so I called. I called George Duke, and it was like a a, um, a Saturday, and he goes, "Hello." He answered the phone. You know. Oh wow. <laughs> said, is this George Duke? And he goes, "Yes." And I said, "My name is Jeff Richmond. I'm a guitar player." You know, I was just like frantic, and he goes, is it, "And I, I'm a guitar player." And he goes, "Well, as a matter of fact." I had a guitar player, but it's not, I don't know if it's going to work out. So I'm kind of maybe looking for a guitar player. Can you audition on Monday? And I said, yeah, man, for sure. I'll take a plane tomorrow and get there. He goes, wait a minute, take a plane. Where are you? What do you mean? He goes, I'm in, I went, I'm in New York and you're in LA. I'll fly out there tomorrow. Don't even worry about it. Yep. Said, really? Are you sure? I mean, he was kind of blew, blown away. I got on the plane. I got into a, hotel, a motel on Sunset Boulevard. Spent the night, took a, a cab or a bus to SAR Studios, which is down some, which is down the street a couple miles. And I and I was in LA and I did the audition. And he really auditioned really well. You know, certain people auditioned in different ways. Mm -hmm. But he, he had like about 15 things to check check me out on. And he said, Okay, play this. And he'd go bump, 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 you know, a groove. And I'd kind of play along and he'd go, okay, okay. Now this, okay, now this. And it just went, it went really fast and really thoroughly. He could get a picture of my playing. And he goes, okay, cool, you're done. I'll call you tomorrow and let you know what's happening. So I went back to the hotel. The phone rings and he goes, hey, it's George. Well, the guitar player that I originally um, hired, he's going to come back. I'm sorry. But I really liked you. And so right now there's three other people looking for guitar players and I'm going to get you a gig with one of them for sure. Oh. One, one is Flora Purman Ayrton. Mm -hmm. The other one is Billy Cobham. And the other one is Tony Williams. Wow. They're all wow. looking for guitar players. So don't worry, just sit tight. So <laughs> I sat tight, I got a phone call and it was Flora Purman's manager. And he said, I'll pick you up tonight and we're going we're to audition you tonight. Wow. So I, I, got, I got a ride with him. I walk into this re rehearsal studio, and who's there? Jimmy Haslip and Ricky Lawson. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, wow, they man. Wow. We just met. All three of us met the first time. Wow. What so a what a trio we, that is right there, you, yeah. Jimmy, and Ricky. And then and Ayerto was there, and Flora Porn was there, and there was a great keyboard player named Hugo Fataruso from um, um, South America, Ecuador, I think. Mm -hmm. And we and talk about audition, what a different audition this was. We just jammed and jammed and jammed and jammed for four hours straight, just on grooves and stuff. And Ayerto was playing his percussion instruments. And then the next day we jammed and jammed and jammed again. So I got that gig. Wow, isn't that something? And then wow. that, that made me move to LA. That, that, that's a really interesting story. It, I love that. that. That's a long answer. No, it's a great answer too. Uh, I remember you telling me a little bit about that story and meeting Jimmy at the floor Purim audition. I didn't know Ricky Lawson was there. Very interesting. Yeah. He did. He did we, 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 we toured for around um, two months with Ricky and Jimmy and Ayerto and, you know, the whole thing. Wow. Man, I, I've only, I saw Ayerto with uh, just once. It was a different kind of situation. It was uh, a super band, they called it. Uh, Stanley Clark, Randy Brecker. Maybe Jim Beard, Steve Smith, Ellen Holsworth, and Erto. That sounds like a super band, all right. It, it, I, yeah, there's some recordings of that on YouTube too. I don't think they ever recorded a CD or anything. But and then uh, Ricky Lawson, I saw. Man, did, did was he with? Uh, he was with the Jackets for a while, right? Okay. Yeah, he's the founding one of the founding members of the Yellow Jackets. That's uh. So sad that he passed because yeah I I've only heard stories about him but I I saw him a couple times with the jackets and then the last time I saw him it was a weird situation um and I didn't know it was him and this is 12 13 years ago it's uh I'm, I'm setting up my little Slingerland kit in my 60s Slingerland kit in this little tiny area in this uh, fancy restaurant where I used to play with this really great singer here, Ronnie Lee, who I love. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a super little quartet that we had. But I'm setting up and this guy walks in and I didn't see him walk in. He says, Slingerland, man, that was my first kit. Love it. And I didn't really think anything of it. I just turned around and like, oh, yeah, I, yeah, I, like, I like it. Thank you. I said, do you play drums? He says, yeah, yeah, I play drums. <laughs> I'm playing around the corner with a little band tonight. Uh, and then he's asking a lot of questions. I, but he must, he, he lost a lot of weight from the 80s to before he passed away because he used to be heavier. And I also thought he was a lot taller. Um, he wasn't as tall as I thought off the stage. So still, I don't know that it's him. Like, oh, cool. Uh, well, and, and we had to start. So I'm like, oh, I hope you can hang out. I said, oh, I'll try to come back on a break or something. And he says, we're just around the corner. Come over and hear us if you get time. And he walks out. And then, like, somebody walks in. And in between songs, they you see Ricky Lawson's playing with Gerald Albright tonight. He's crushing it. I'm like, oh, shit. I knew that I, I recognized the face, but I was so out of context. I didn't know I was even talking to the guy. And I feel bad because he's been an influence to me. I, I really, you know, Stevie Wonder and sure. Stevie Al Dan. and all these bands. I mean, holy cow, man. He's done. He, he played some great stuff. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was wonderful. Yeah. Wow. So this brings you then. So now you're you moved to L.A. And then you did. You've done a lot out there. You've been there for since. Is it the early '80s, late '70s? Yeah, yeah, early '80s. I would say like 19, 1979, 1980, 81, something. Okay. Like that. Well, um, I know you know. Um, well, they actually, so some of the videos I used to watch, my son and I would just get on. We put on YouTube and we'd see Jeff Richmond at the baked potato. And, you know, I've heard about this place for ever. And so finally, when we were out, uh, when I was out there for the first time we recorded this CD, we just put out, 
Right. Um, remember, we went over the potato. I saw Lorber with Haslip, and uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't remember the drummer's name. He was great, though. Uh, Gary Novak, maybe? No, no. I, um, Steve Haas? Yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah, he was, it was tight. But it was so good to finally get there. And then, of course, you and I are sitting at the bar eating a gigantic potato we each had. <laughs> Which I didn't know they actually serve baked potatoes there, but I don't know where they get them. They're like uh, actually flown from Idaho. Really? Yeah. Wow, they're like potatoes on steroids or something. That are miracle grow because they're, they're they huge, are. and there are so many great uh, potatoes you can get, different flavors. That's yeah, it's really cool to be in that club now, and then finally see the setup, so that when I'm looking at YouTube now and I see you there. I can imagine where whoever it was was sitting who recorded it. And well, that, that club has such history, you know. I mean, it started over 50 years ago, and it was, you know, it, you know, who bought it, who, who started it. it was this guy named Don Randy. Okay. Who was the piano, one of the piano players in the famous recording band called The Wrecking Crew. Oh, I've heard of them. The Wrecking Crew was a band with Hal Blaine on drums and Carol Kay on bass and all these, and Glenn Campbell on guitar. And no kidding. Played, Wow. Yeah, they played on all these albums with Sonny and Cher, the Beach Boys, um, everything, Jan and Dean, you know, um, that album Pet Sounds by the Beach Boys, they're on that. So, you know, Don Randy bought that club for so he could play there you know, himself. Okay. And he played there like five nights a week. And the other two nights, which were off nights, Sunday night and Monday night, mm -hmm. you have younger, you know, younger, you know, people play there and, and he got like Lee Rittenauer to play there and Larry Carlton and stuff like that. And that's where those guys started their careers basically as solo artists in, at the Baked Potato on Sunday and Monday nights. No kidding, yeah. See, that's really, uh, that's cool. That, that's really, I mean, of course right now I guess nothing's happening there because of the COVID, but, not, not right but typically there. it's like seven nights a week they're having music, I think. Seven nights a week. And it, you know you know what else about that place? It sounds really good. In there. Yeah, it does. And we, we were in kind of what I would have normally considered a strange spot to sit to get good sound, and it sounded good. Yeah. Lorber and Hazlitt and them. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, so what... what but I, I planted the big potato like about once every month or once every two months and for the last you know years i would put different bands together right and, and so that was kind of fun yeah yeah that is really cool um what are some other experiences you've had did you say you work with uh, blood sweat and tears at one point well a real long time ago when mike stern was having you know problems he was playing with with blood sweat and tears so i kind of subbed for them for a month I see. Okay. And I was really like green, you know, and I wasn't anywhere near as, as together as Mike Stern was. So I, I was sort of struggling. It wasn't the greatest gig, but it was the greatest gig for just getting some experience, you know? Yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, what was it like working with that band? It was, it was, it was cool. I mean, I was definitely, it was definitely, I wasn't the, I was, I wasn't ready for the gig, but it was kind of cool. Don Elias was on drums. No kidding. So he wow. was a very cool guy to be around. Very, very cool. And, um, you know, and, and then Mike, Mike, I, I just kind of subbed for Mike for a month. But it okay. was great. It was great. I mean, I, I did the best I could do. That's yeah. for sure. So is David Clayton Thomas singing? Yeah, he was singing. He, 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 I, you know, he was, I know he's a kind of a strange guy, but um, I liked him. He's uh, a person I've occasionally been in touch with because uh, he lives just like four hours away from here. He's Toronto I, area. I see. And, well, he, uh, had a, he has a unique voice, that's for sure. He does. I really, really like his voice. Um, I don't know if he's singing anymore. I don't know if he's gigging, but... But you know, the album I liked was when Al Cooper was, was with Blood, Sweat and Tears. I don't know if I knew that, or I don't think I have any of that. The first album that Blood and Tears made was with Al Cooper, I think. Really? Wow, interesting. I think. I'm sure. I have to check that out. Um, 
So it was Don, oh yeah, Don Elias. I actually met, I've heard a lot of stories about him and being fun to be around. Uh, Peter Riskin told me we had breakfast in Toronto a few years ago. We spent three hours practically floated away. We drank so much coffee. Uh, he had some of the funniest, funniest Don Elias stories. Um, and another gentleman here, uh, right near me, Rick Montalbano Sr. Montalbano Jr. is living out near you now. He's married to the singer uh, Jane Monheit. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And Montalbano Jr. is a total, total badass drummer. I mean, the guy is okay. serious in every, anything he wants to play and he's stylistically whatever, he's the man. But his father, Rick Sr., used to tour with Lou Rawls and Don Elias was on the band at the time. Don Elias did a lot of gigs. He's another conga player, percussionist, you know what I mean? And he played yeah. with Miles on Bitches Brew, you know what I mean? Yeah, I forgot he, about that. And he played with Joni Mitchell, you know, and that, with that great band with, um, with Pat Metheny and Lyle Mays and Michael Brecker. Ah, uh, uh, you know, Shadows and Light. Yeah. Shadows yeah. and Light. The, I mean, I paid a lot of money to get that whole concert on v, VHS back in the 80s. Now it's on YouTube for free. But I mean, you know, to be able to, not just to hear it, because I have the double album too, but to see them, you know, Incredible. to see. I never saw Joni live. Um, I saw everyone in her band, at that band, live many times. And Don, actually, one night he was uh, touring with Sanborn and he was playing here and he was kind of a pretty tall guy too, I think. Uh, he and Rick Montalbano come out because Rick was there at the show watching and they were hanging out afterwards. So I got to spend a little time with him. He was just always smiling. Don is always smiling. He seems like he was always happy. I mean, yeah. yeah there, 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 was, there was one time when my parents lived up in the Bay Area and I went up there to visit my parents and, and at the time the, the, in San Francisco, the jazz club was called the Keystone Corner. It's, a I've heard of that. it's kind of like the was the baked potato of San Francisco. Yeah. So I was friendly with this bass player named Larry Klein a long time ago. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, we, it was kind of a, not like we didn't, we stopped being friends. It's just he, his, his, his career moved on a different path than mine. But we were friendly for a while. He was playing at Keystone Corner with Don Elias and Freddie Hubbard. Right. I think they recorded something there, too. There's a lot of classic albums are recorded there. Probably. And I, I went there to sort of visit, to say hi to Larry. And Larry was really nice, and Don was there, and he was really nice. And Joni Mitchell was there. Was Joni huh. Mitchell hanging out with Don Elias, with Freddie Hubbard. Oh, they were actually in a relationship for a while. I think like. for a little while. Yeah. So I went backstage, and I just sat there like a fly on the wall and Larry Klein was very nice and, and they went to play. And so who was left in the dressing room? Me and Joni Mitchell. And Joni Mitchell for the whole set was smoking cigarettes and talking to me and talking to me and talking to me the whole time. And I was just going, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh -huh, yeah, yeah, uh -huh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was just like, I can't believe I'm, this is happening. That was a memorable experience for me. Oh, it had to be. I mean, and then, then, then what happened was, you know, Don Elias, they kind of broke up and she got together with Larry Klein and they got married. Yeah, they got married. I remember. Yeah. 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 And, and then I, there's a video I just saw the other day. In fact, I downloaded it onto my phone. Um, the Refu Refugees of the Road. It's uh, Michael Landau. Oh, yeah. Vinny on drums. And Russell Ferrante. Yes, and Larry Klein and Joni. And that, I mean, there's some, first of all, I like the compositions quite a lot. But I mean, you know, Landau kills me. The guy, oh. I don't know if you know him or not, but I mean, I've never yeah. seen him, but I love that guy. He's Jeez. just about my favorite guitar player in Los Angeles. I mean, what, what an, an amazing talent that he is but that band the band was really they're just smoking they were <laughs> incredible they were you, so great i know you know all these people like and you've worked a lot with vinnie in fact some of the youtube videos i have uh downloaded are vinnie and you at the baked potato well, it I seems like uh and i don't know i've never met Vinny. i've only seen him a couple times but 
I love the talk. I knew Vinny, so. I knew Vinny from Vinny from back when I was at Berkeley College of Music. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, that's yeah. right. He was there for a while, right? But for just a month or two. And then Zappa picked him up or something. But I was friends with Steve Smith back then, and Steve and Vinny were friends, and I met Vinny through Steve. And, okay. And then, then when I came out to remember the, the Flora Purim gig, yeah. I was out in LA for a month rehearsing, and that month, Vinny, oddly enough, was playing with Al Cooper, who I just mentioned. Yeah. That was his first like real gig, you know what I mean? So he was in LA when I was in LA. So we hung out like every day and drove all over the place. And, and, and he's such a, like a wild personality, so like open and up and very smart and very nice. I had such yeah. a great time with him. And then of course he, he became the drummer for Frank Zappa and he became like a, the best, he's super incredible. And he's always been the nicest guy to me. He's so, He's so he's so such a great guy and such a great drummer, unbelievable. Yeah, that's just a talent. Uh, I, you know, I I've never gotten over him. And what I mean by that is, my my introduction to hearing him was actually when the triple vinyl came out of "Shut Up and Play Your Guitar," and he plays on that's a Zappa thing. Right. There's no no vocals. Uh, there might be one tune with vocals or something, but. That is like the polyrhythmic Bible still. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, and, and I, I still listen to that sometimes. Um, but that launched me into listening to Vinny. And this is like 40 years ago, literally 40 years ago. And I, I can't get over it. And that's because he's so damn good and he's so versatile. And he's, he's also evolved, you know, like all great musicians do. They, he's become more Vinny than he used to be. If you know what I mean. I mean, you know, you record with him, you work with him. But I love how he's uh, really, really developed. And he started out way out front, and now he's just at another level, you know? He, he was so amazing about him is, like, when, when he records your music, it's like, it's like he plays it for the first time or second time, and it's as if he's known it all his life. Isn't that something? Wow. Like, it's like he's known, he, he, he has such a deep understanding of where it should go. And, and it's almost like he'd been practicing it forever. And, you know, it, it's so unbelievable to watch him record. But, you know, when we were recording our album, Dream, mm -hmm. it was kind of similar to hearing, watching Peter Erskine play. Ah, oh, man. What an experience. I, I have a lot of video of that. And when I listen to the final product, um, I just have to show everybody. Sure. This is it. In fact, I'm going to open it up because I need to open another one. Uh, you're getting some from me here. Next week, they'll arrive uh, a bunch. But here we've got, a, a, if you can see the photo. There it is. But yep. there's no, on the bottom, I can see it's Jimmy, you, Novak, Scott and me, and on the top we have Peter sitting at the drums. Right. And, you know, when I listen to the final product here and I think of what raw stuff he had, what everything that was missing, I can't believe how beautifully, like, it's almost like he could hear the end product while he was doing it. Right, that's kind of what I'm saying. Those, there's a few people like that, a few yeah. select people. Not everybody is that intuitive and that, that incredible but Vinny is one of them I mean we spend half the time eating lunch and just telling jokes and uh, the rest of the time he did maybe two takes max you know taking a half whatever and he's done and he's out right he, and, and, I, I, yeah and the process with, with Vinny is interesting because you know he's kind of fiddling about and you might go up to him and say here's the music and he's not really he doesn't really care so much about the music yet. He's not, finally he decides, okay, I'm ready. And then he looks at the music, he might ask a few questions, and then he goes, okay, let's, let's go. And then, you know, he starts, you know, and, you know, um, I, I, I would say something, like, do you want to go over it one time, like first? And he goes, yeah, okay, no, 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 let's just record it. So wow. usually it's like the first time or maybe the second time. <laughs> It's just magic. And then he's back doing his thing, getting on the phone or eating something. Or... Yeah. Oh, wow, man. You know, he, he's a really, you know, like there was one time when 
I asked him to do this recording. It was one of those tribute albums that I produced a long time ago. Oh, yeah. And um, I gave him the dates. And uh, he said, yeah, let's do it. And then he called me like a week before. And he goes, you know what? I got, a, I got asked to do a video with Chaka Khan during those, those dates. I was wondering if I could move, move our dates. And of course, I said, yeah, whatever you want. man." And he goes, OK, let, let me think about it. He called me back and he said, no, I'm going to keep those dates. If Chaka Khan wants me, she'll call me. I'm committed to you and that's what I'm going to do. Wow. That's class. Yeah. That's, that's a classy guy. That's a class act. Yeah. That's, you know, you committed. He did it. He honored his word. He showed up. Yeah, that's that's class, man. That's really good. That's yeah. a great example for people. The guy that's as heavy duty as him, you know, because he, he would have been fine. He had moved it. Yeah. But I really appreciated that about him. That's so nice. Yeah. Um, what do you have uh what do you have going on right now musically? It seems like you've been writing some music during the the COVID time. <laughs> I wrote I, I've got a couple like four tunes that I'm almost finished with, and then I wrote this fifth tune just the other day that, that I'm really happy with that I, and I kind of put it on YouTube, kind of like the first take. It was a little bit sloppy, but it was kind of cool. Not that much is really happening right now. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm just tr hanging in there, you know, um, trying to enjoy life every day. And, and, uh, but, you know, I'm just kind of basically writing and recording and practicing a little bit. I've got, since you know I'm kind of under lockdown, I've got all these guitars out open. So if I if I just feel like playing one of them, I'll just go and grab one and, and kind of mess around. But a bunch of acoustic guitars. I've got yeah. four or five electric guitars here. I got you know, but not much is happening. Well, so this might be a good time to segue. Uh, um, I met you originally over the phone. It'd be August this year. It'd be two years. And it's because Jimmy, Jimmy contacted me, Jimmy Haslip, and uh, he said, you know, I have a friend who's a guitar player, he's a great guitar player, and he's a great friend, and I know you, you know, because Jimmy knows what I do and the teaching I've been doing and work with people with movement disorders, particularly Parkinson's, and he said, this gentleman has Parkinson's, and uh, what can you, you know, would you be interested or, or consider even talking with him? So first of all, just let me tell you this. If it wasn't you, I would have said yes. It would have been anybody. I, would, I will help anybody. I'll talk to anybody, right? Um, but then he told me who it is, Jeff Richmond. I'm like, what? <laughs> Wait a minute. I mean, that guy, that Jeff, this is more than one Jeff Richmond? No, no, this is the Jeff Richmond you're thinking it is. And so in, in, in that respect, uh, it was, it's been, a, actually, it's just been a great experience to get to know you and hang out and tell funny stories. And I love hearing your stories, man. <laughs> Some great stories. But um, as I segue into this too, and I, for some reason my brain's not working here, I think I'm a little overwhelmed with thoughts, Is is um, but I'll just focus down this path is we started talking and how, how has, uh, how ha have you found, first of all, that having living with Parkinson's has affected you uh, as a musician? Let's say in your technique or your playing, or what kinds of things are you are you battling um, currently? And it, like, has it changed very much since your original diagnosis? Because it's been a few years, I think, right? It's been about maybe ten years. Okay. And I, I, I mean, it's maybe it's gotten a little bit worse, but thank God it's not. Is, is, I, I wouldn't call the word mild, but it's a condition that, you know, mi mild. I wouldn't call it a mild, but it's like a condition, you know, that I have that I'm aware of. And it affects my playing in, in a couple ways. One way, it makes me not as motivated. It used to be, I used to be really driven, you know, like really kick butt, always hustling. So it's kind of like dampered that a little bit. And then the other thing is, um, when I play, when I physically play, since I have a little bit of a tremor, it's not terrible, yeah. but, but um, I, I kind of miss notes sometimes. Now, the funny thing is, 
a lot of other people don't really notice that I'm missing notes, but I notice it. And there's certain things that I can't pull off that I used to pull off. I used to be, I think, really good. Now I'm just okay. I can't pull everything off. But the weird thing is, it's, it, it's psychologically, when I miss a note, it messes me up psych psychologically. You know what I mean? I get all insecure and I get um, you know, kind of depressed. So I have to, it's, it's almost not the Parkinson's that I fight. It's my mind getting insecure about my playing. So a lot of times I push myself to like keep playing and not think about that stuff. And it gets better. You know, it kind of, I, I eliminate that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because the missing of the notes isn't isn't so terrible, actually. Mm -hmm. It's more the psychological impact of that missing the notes that messes me up. Yeah, I mean, you know, sense? am I making sense? I, I totally. So I'll, I'll use a, another analogy here. Is uh, you know, any one of us could be holding on to a cup of coffee and you know, spill it or something like that, right? And I know so many people who have uh, a tremor for one reason or other, or just lack of control. And, you know, many times Parkinson's might be involved. Um, but the spilling of the coffee or the water, that's, that's never really the big deal. It's the impact psychologically. Right. Um, oh, I spilled it. Um, am I going to spill it again? Am I going to lose more control? I mean, there's things I hear from people. Uh, did anyone notice? Have they upset sure. anybody? Yeah. And, you know, statistically, um, it's well documented and well known that depression is the number one non-motor symptom in Parkinson's, generally speaking. It doesn't mean that everyone with who lives with Parkinson's is actually depressed, or if they experience it, it's not all the time, although for some it is all the time. And anxiety is the second, second most uh, specifically second motor non-motor symptom and the, then the anxiety can exacerbate motor symptoms so it becomes more so there's a lot of psychological stuff that can happen exactly. Exactly. and I think you know the lack of dopamine even if you're taking like cinnamon or levodopa those replacement medications are not the same as the real deal and they may kick in and make you feel just fine for a while. And this is different for everybody too. Uh, and sometimes it's based on their level of activity too. If they're more active, they have a longer lasting effect or better effect. Um, but even that's not always the case. But bottom line is uh, dopamine is also a motivator. Dopamine is something that will get you up and right. get you moving. Right. So it, while I'm sad to know that you have this, and I've known it for a couple of years, um, it, you recognize these things and you battle against it anyways. And that's why I, I, some people don't like it. Most people don't mind. I call them people with Parkinson's who have that ad, attitude of a, a, a fighter, like a PD fighter. You, you're combating and you're fighting back and you're not letting it define you. You haven't mm -hmm. given up. You aren't I, Parkinson's. You live with it. I almost um, think of it in a weird way, <laughs> like it's a pet or my pet dog. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's always with me. Sometimes it's kind of not that easy to be around the, this animal. You know what I mean? And sometimes it's it's great. You yeah. know, it's okay. It's kind of it's 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 a condition that I have. It's not like a disease. It's a condition. It's like something that I have with me. And, and a lot of times I feel um more. I'm a little more reclusive, shall we say? You know what I mean? And I'm kind of shy away from getting in the car and going somewhere and doing something like I used to be. But if I push myself to talk to somebody or be with somebody or go out, it's like, it's better. I yeah. feel better. It's like a natural dopamine. You know, uh, you know I just, uh, the other day, I just was talking with this guy who, who's written uh, a lot of my favorite books. Um, a couple of them I don't have up here, but this Harvard professor, he's an MD, John Rady, Dr. John Rady wrote, this and this and okay those are great books i'll have to send you the uh you might really enjoy these i think you enjoy yeah. them a lot especially when he gets into talking about the brain and how it works and how dopamine can be created uh, oh there's another thing too a, a brain um uh, a growth factor can be created by doing things you like to do and by doing, let's say, just getting out and 
walking, you know, as, as briskly as you can while still being safe. It's called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, and he talks about that one a lot in this book. So you get serotonin, you get brain-derived neurotrophic factor, you get dopamine. When you're doing things that you like to do, all of us get that. I mean, all of us, because we all have brains. We're all humans. Um, and what I like is that you, when you push yourself, like you'll push yourself to do stuff, and then you recognize you feel better. That's one of the ways to keep fighting too, because otherwise, man, it could get really bad. Yeah, if you just sit by yourself and you just kind of sit around, which I do, but you know that's not good if you do it for too long. Yeah, most people can't do that and be okay long term. Yeah. Yeah, I like my alone time, but not that much. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's why I keep the guitars out. You know, what I mean, I pick up something. I can, I keep some, uh, like, have some music books open so I can immediately look at something and play along with it. And um, trying to write music, trying to practice electric guitar, you know, and also, you know, listen, listen to a bunch of stuff. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, when we do things we like to do, we're going to have uh, the dopamine, dop dopamine effect. Uh, but, but but you're right about the whole cinnamon thing because what it is is like you start feeling you, you take it you take the cinnamon that's what I'm taking and it feels you feel okay and then you start noticing you kind of lose track and you start noticing God I'm feeling kind of depressed or not not right and then oh it's because I need some more dopamine yeah right right yeah um it's always up and down up and down up and down yeah you know that's another thing there's a saying uh i think probably michael j fox said it. if you met one per person with parkinson's you met one person with parkinson's because <laughs> every person's uniquely affected differently and it can change day to day you know i mean correct, correct. sometimes for some people i don't know if you ever experienced this but the on period when the medicine has, the uptake is complete and it's in your system and it's effective, that on period for some people is a, a different level of on certain times, you know? And I don't know what it is, could be activity level, could be what you ate, is it interferes or another medication. I mean, there's so many different factors, you know, lack of yeah, sleep. Yeah. It's mysterious. I think a lot, of, you're right. Some of it has to do with eating. What I've heard, what I heard from my doctor was to not eat protein at the same time that you eat some dopamine. Yes. You know, I wish I knew why. Um, nutrition's not the, although that's what I went to school for, it's still not my strong point in relation to Parkinson's and medication. I mean, I can tell you that, uh, there's a lot of good material out there that says if you go 100% plant-based, you're probably going to be uh, clearing up a lot of stuff. But I'm no doctor, and I can, I'm not plant-based. <laughs> right. I, I have my healthy meat here and there, and uh, I was a vegetarian for three and a half years. I just I didn't feel good. And now I do, um, but yeah, lack of sleep is another big one too. Do you how are you, how is it for you sleeping? Do you sleep well? I sleep, well? I sleep pretty good. I mean, the only thing I'm on sort of a schedule now that sort of I go to sleep sort of early and I wake up early. Yeah, but I go to sleep around ten thirty, eleven, maybe something like that. Ten, eleven, and I wake up at about five thirty or six. I wake up a little early. But I sleep seven hours or so, and I'm, I'm pretty good, you know what I mean? So that hasn't really affected. Sometimes I sit on the couch, watch TV, and I notice I fall asleep. Uh -huh. So I don't have any really sleep problems, I don't think. That's good, though. And, you know, one of the things that's really, really important, and this is well documented, too, is it getting into a structure for your day. So if your structure of your day is around 1030, or so, or half an hour later, whatever, within a half an hour, like 10, 30, 11, every night you go to bed and you wake up the same time every morning. If you stay in that, it's just so much better for you. Well, I've and noticed it, the whole COVID thing has made me be like that. Yeah, as a matter of fact, yeah. Are we, is the time running out? Oh, no, I wanted to show you something. I've got a few more minutes here. Okay. Uh, but I want to show you, there's a book, and of course, I want everybody to see it too. My chiropractor, not always 
Not all chiro chiropractors are created equal. I just happen to have a really good one. <laughs> and we send books back and forth titles. This one is called Why We Sleep. Okay. And I have to tell you, this book completely changed everything about how I look at sleep and how I structure my, my day, generally speaking, so that I get enough sleep. Because I wasn't getting enough sleep because I figured I'll sleep when I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> Problem is you might be dead sooner. So, um, but no, the, the effects of sleep are so deep. I had no idea how much it can affect a, a person on a daily basis, on a short-term basis, on a long-term basis. And it really changed because now I go to bed earlier too and I get up earlier, but I have pretty much the same schedule. And I feel so much better now. That's great. I noticed that it makes a big difference as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's see. What do you have going on right now? Any uh, Last time I saw you, about a year ago, we went up to, uh, well, remember we went up to Jeff Beal's house? Yeah, we recorded him playing on uh, on one of my songs. That was that, that's another talented guy right there. When he did that beautiful uh, was a flugelhorn solo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, whoa, man! And now, where's the, what's the status of that recording? Is that that's is that what I know what I said earlier. That's one of the four tunes that I finished. I've been taking a long time, but I've got four tunes that are done, and now this fifth tune. So I'm just kind of going to write a bunch more and, and try to put something out eventually. But that that's not out yet. No. Okay. But that's with Vinny on drums, actually. Yeah, right. I remember that. Yeah. Yep. And, a bass player, and a bass player named Dean Taba played bass on that. Okay. Yeah, I love that tune. I, I, really, uh, I really enjoyed watching Jeff uh, record that solo. It was great. Um, it was so great. Yeah. And the tune is great. Um, Thank you. It was so, fun to hang out with you then. It was really cool. I'm glad uh, I could do it. That was, that was a that was a great time, man. And then I saw you play. I saw you do a gig, and I don't know who was in the band. I just remember uh, going to. I remember we had. I had some really hot ramen uh, noodles next door, like spicy hot. What uh, gig? You know, I don't know. It was on the second floor of some like uh, outdoor shopping center, almost a lot of restaurants. It was like a bluish interior boo whale is that a place was it with a singer uh, yep oh her name is kathy siegel female she's singer very enterprising she's always got stuff going on and she lives right down the street from me oh, okay so that was yeah that was that was that that's fun she's a really great uh great person a great singer really awesome really cool yeah you're playing your butt off man if you hit any wrong notes that night i didn't hear any uh, I'm sure I did. <laughs> and then the remember the place next door where they had the ramen? Yes. Whoa, man! I that was so good because it was really, 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 really well, that, on that, fire, spicy, like set me yeah, on fire. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was Japantown. So okay, okay, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that I was really good. That now I remember that. That was very cool. So, um, in your uh, do you have any like favorites of uh, uh, recordings you've put out there uh, or, or let's say stories related to recording any particular CDs? There's so many of them. Maybe if we could narrow it down, I'm trying to think of. Yeah, you've put out a lot. I, actually, I have a bunch of, I don't have them here with me. Um, those must be down on my CD rack of some of the tribute stuff. Yeah. Isn't there a weather report tribute? No. No. I wanted to do that, but no. You were thinking of doing that. Okay. What are some of the tributes I, you've I, done? I did, I did a Coltrane one, a Miles one, yeah. Ma Vishnu one, a Santana one, a Jeff Beck one, and a Steely Dan one. Oh, man. Okay. I have the train, and I have the Miles, and I have the... Uh, Actually, those might be the only two. No, no, no. Ma the thing, the thing Mahavishnu, cool. I have that one too. Oh, the Mahavishnu, yeah. The thing that's cool about that is the, the whole concept of these albums was in every track I'd get a famous guitar player to be featured on. Mm -hmm. And also I got to be featured on one too. 
So I have a lot of interesting stories about some of the guitar players that passed through. Um, oh, I'd love to hear some. I'd love to hear some. Uh, let me think. I mean, there was one with Al Demiola. It's kind of interesting. Um, you know, Al Demiola, I knew him back in Berkeley when I went to Berkeley. And he's a real sweet guy, very, very uh, sensitive guy. You wouldn't think so because he kind of looks like a tough, a tough Italian, uh, New Jersey kind of, hey man, you know, but he's actually really, you know, kind of sensitive and, and he's, and he's, you know, he, he's a great guitar player. Yeah. So he's really, he's got kind of a big ego. He's into himself. You know, he's very confident of himself. So when we went in the studio, this song, I have to admit it was a song, Asia, the song Asia that I had. In oh, yeah. and, and I altered it and made it in seven, you know, the time signature being seven, four. Yep. And a lot of chord changes, and, and I put them in there in the studio, and it was sort of like, oh, my God, what am I doing here, you know? And since he knew me and trusted me, he, he like, he was sort of a couple times, he was like, Jeff, what do I play here? I don't, I don't know what to, what, what scale, what scale do I, you know, and here Al Demiola, the, the, you know, the legend, <laughs> tell, asking me, what scale do I play on? But I just went, yeah, it's it's a, it's like a, a, it's this scale. And he goes, oh yeah, oh yeah, right. And he and then he would do it, and he goes, what do I play here? What do I play here? And he was really like opening up, and it was really sweet, you know, because he he wanted help, you know what I mean? And it was great that he trusted me to ask him for help. Yeah. So we're moving right along, everything's sounding good, and then at the end of the solo. I put all these chords there that were like triads that were bass notes, like diminished, like really out chords, a lot of them. And I'm thinking, oh my God, what's he gonna do here? And then he said, oh my God, Jeff, what am I gonna do here? And I said, okay, I thought about it. I said, Al, you're Al Demiola. You are Al Demiola. <laughs> <laughs> you are one of the best guitar players I've ever heard in my life. You're, you're, you gotta just do Al Demiola, whatever it is, just go for it and do what Al Demiola does. I don't know. And he kind of went, Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Okay, yeah, because oh he's totally in his comfort zone with me that, you know, he, 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 was, he was very nice feeling to have that he trusted me. And he goes, You're right, I am Al Demiola. So he goes, Okay, okay, okay. And so he put his Al Demiola hat on and he just ripped. And it was just like, holy Jesus, it's incredible. That was incredible. Wow, and he man. pulled it off, he pulled it off and it was just great. And you know, after that, we, we kind of got together from time to time and had dinners and we, 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 I mean, I'm still friends with him but we don't really hang out anymore. That was about eight years ago. Mm -hmm. But that's a good story. You know, I love I mean, that story. I, you know, I saw him twice. Once was with Return to Forever back in the early '70s. Right, he had just taken over Bill Connor's spot. That's when I. That's when I met him around then. Before then, I was around him when he got the gig and all that stuff. Wow. Yeah. That. I mean, that was an experience. I was like 13 or something at the time. Really into it. My my English teacher uh, is the one who turned me on to Billy Cobham, because I was all Buddy Rich and Big Band stuff. And then he said, you got to hear this guy, Billy Cobham. And then there's this other guy, Chick Corrier. He called him Chick Corrier. <laughs> he says, this is, it's Return to Forever with Chick Corrier. And then you need to check out Billy Cobham. And he let me borrow some vinyl. And that was it. That changed my life. And then I went to see Jimmy O with Chick Corrier the next year. <laughs> You know, I saw I saw the Mahavishnu Orchestra at the Whiskey A Go Go on one of their first gigs. Whoa, man! It, it was I was I was still I mean I think I was still in high school, yeah, and uh, it was just mind boggling. It was so good. Yeah, I, I they came here, but uh, it was just probably just before I even knew about them. I see. Just just before. Um, yeah, it was actually, uh, uh, well, actually, there's footage of, of that concert on YouTube. Yeah, they were up at the university where I was working until COVID, and I'll go back when, when the gym opens. Right. But I saw Al maybe four or five years ago in Buffalo at, uh, uh, there's a casino in Niagara Falls, actually, so Niagara Falls, and I couldn't see the drummer. 
I, Is it Joel yeah. Taylor by any chance? Yeah, and you know, it's funny, I'd seen Joel only if, uh, three, four times with Ernest Tibbs and Alan Holdsworth, and I didn't recognize Joel Taylor in his playing with Di Miola, but man, he sounded freaking great when he introduced him at the end. Oh, that's Joel Taylor. I know you know Joel really well. well I, I recommended Joel to Al's gig. Al asked me if, he, if I knew a drummer. Oh, cool. And I recommend yeah. Joel because Joel would be the, would, would have been the best that I could think of. Yeah, that was a really good show. It was really, really good. Joel is like a poor man's Vinny. I mean, he can pretty much do anything. He can do like, he can read anything. He can play any style, any time signature, any groove. He's just like remarkable. One of the most unsung, un, un, you know, whatever, to deserve wider recognition. Yeah. Yeah, he's another one I need to watch and listen to more. Well, you know, I want to go back to something too, because I love how you take this, you'll take a, something that influences you for an example, um, like you said, with the, uh, the, the G flat waltz, and then you do your own inspiration of it, right? Your own version, it's inspired by that, but it's uniquely yeah. your song. Yeah. Or you'll take songs like uh, uh, Asia, put it into seven. And I love how you do that. And you did it on this with, uh, right. well, in particular, the, the one that's coming to my right, mind right now is Don't the uh, Peter Gabriel uh, song, Don't Give Up. And the whole, I, I played this for a friend of mine recently who's not a music person at all. And I said, do you recognize that song? She says, yeah, I've heard it somewhere. I've heard it, but this is, this is different, it's unique. I said, did, did you listen to the words? Yeah, is it don't give up? I said, yeah. And what's cool is it's so uniquely different. And in my opinion, I mean, it's a masterpiece, the way you arrange that. From the extra beats here and there and the bars of different times thrown right. in. And a different, I don't know a lot about music theory, but it sounds like there's some interesting chords. Well, you know, a, lot of, a lot of times when I write something or I arrange something like that, that arrangement was really special. I, and now that it's, that it's over, when it's done, it's like, how did I, how did that, 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 was, that was amazing. How did that come out like that? You know, I don't know. It's just, it really is a, a masterpiece. And, and then talking about Peter again, too, because you know, here's, a, here's a version of a tune that's completely different than the original um, in many respects. And he just nails it. Reading, just reading the music, boom, 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 boom. Yeah, that sounded okay. Let's listen back. He was, he was unbelievable. And, and at the end, the, the, the kind of fills that he plays at the end, you know, with my, with my sort of solo, Oh it's, yeah, it's really unique. It's really I'm really proud of that. I gotta say, I gotta say that's I think the proudest moment on on the, on the whole album is that arrangement for me. Oh yeah, I absolutely love it. Absolutely love it. Plus, I love that song, anyways. Um, and, and I really appreciate it for you giving me the opportunity to do it. Oh well, the whole thing's been an honor for me. You know, getting to know you, um, uh, just just everything. The other thing too is like Peter has this. Um, elasticity that's involved in that well in, in general he has that anyways that when he's in a situation where he can be elastic he's like elven in a, in a way in his own way i totally get it you and know. like this there's some parts my son was even saying because he's he knows a lot about music more than i do he's saying man like how did he pull off those things towards the end of the song with that feeling it's almost like he wasn't quite there, but he's right there. It's well, kind it's, of it's, 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 it's his experience, it's all the years. It's it is. Long. Yeah, it really is. It it really shows. It's just it's just amazing. I still sometimes my head spins when I think about who's on this thing. Right. <laughs> and then and then the fact that my name is here. I mean, come on, man. I never thought I'd do that. Well, thank you. For, it's great. I'm really proud of it. I can't wait to get a copy of it. Oh yeah, you'll get about 20 of them here soon. Okay. Um, so, you know, I think we should do this again sometime uh, soon. Let's do, let's do. Cause uh, there's a lot more you have to tell us. I know there is, cause I've heard it yeah. already and I want to hear more. <laughs> I'm writing like this sort of book about stories of mine. So. Um, oh, good. I'm doing it during this time. So I'm kind of having fun with that. 
Yeah, yeah, do that. Do, do the book. Um, I'll be the first one in line to get a copy because it's just, you know, for me as a, a, a former musician for a career, if you will, um, hearing the stories about people who I, I really was influenced by is is always interesting. And I don't know why, you know, it, but it is interesting to me. And, and I think what it really comes down to is the humanity part of it. That we're humans and, you know, I mean, everyone has their quirks and their issues. Your mom quirky as hell, if you really know me. I just try to keep it to myself. But I mean, <laughs> like, you know, it, the stories, they're great. And, and there are a lot of inspiring stories too. Like when you say, I remember you told me, uh, I won't say the other person involved in this, but I will say that you told me a, an inspiring Dave Weckl story about his generosity in that situation of having to redo a recording. That was really unexpected and I didn't think it would, be, it would come from him and he was so kind. Never and those, see, those are great stories. That's and, and Vinny, how Vinny and, and that El Miola story you just told. I didn't know that, and I think that's just really cool. How Vinny yeah. is so nice and and yes. supportive and playing f for the song always, you know. And and then uh, with Weka, like I, I was so pleased to hear that. I, just because it's nice to hear those kind of things. Here's a guy who's you know in demand and who knows about his time. And then what happened? The file got lost or erased. The engineer erased. The everything it was just a nightmare and and i wanted you know i want to know if he would be willing to go in the studio and, and redo it all it's just so embarrassing and he, he went sure you know he was without even a, a second thought yeah it was just so incredible but i mean that's i just love hearing that kind of thing too yeah, he's a good, good guy man he's a really good guy yeah i've gotten to know him a little and you know it, actually that first trip out there last year I ended up at his house um, at the recording studio visiting and talking and that was fun yeah yeah he's just fantastic we, about him. Dave and I are both really into muscle cars like I you know I rented that Dodge Challenger <laughs> so we had to zip up to Jeff Beal's house and I can't go too fast out of state if I get an out of state ticket it's really expensive yeah, right but I'm a muscle car guy and Dave is a muscle car guy. So we actually spend more time talking about cars than music. I'm sure he'd love to talk about that. It's really fun. Uh, yeah, let's do this again sometime. Let's do it again. Let's so this will be a conversation with Jeff Richmond. A continued part one. Yes, part two. Yes, Part up. one. This is part one. We'll do part two soon. Plus the other thing too is honestly, Jeff, I think that uh, I'm realizing and I'm not saying this about you, but but I'll, well, I'll say that I'm concerned to some degree for anybody who's alone. I mean, and I've been finding myself thinking, you know, I really want to find out how people are doing, some people, you know, I want to find out how you're doing. We talked the other day. I, I'm going to be talking to you more because okay. I love our friendship. Plus, I want, I want you to be okay. I mean, I'm 3,000 miles away, but if I could do something, I will, you know. Thank you. Um, you know, and it's it's another thing I've been saying lately in some of my postings is uh, we're, right now it's April 23rd, 2020. We're in the midst of lockdown, wearing masks when we go out. It's the COVID-19 crisis. LA, I just had another surge in cases yesterday maybe or today. And I think it's important to check up on people and see how they're doing and, you know, just check in because it can mean a lot. Sometimes a little bit can go a long way. So five, 10 minutes on the phone can, can last all day for some people. It really you know? does. It really can. You're right. No. You're totally right. Just, well, let's, keep, let's keep communicating. It's for, for sure. Absolutely, my friend. So, all right, uh, Jeff, thank you very much. In fact, if you don't mind, just hang on. I'm going to end the recording in a minute, but okay. I, I won't hang up. So hang with me for a minute. Okay, you got it. Um, I'll just say thank you because this will be posted as, uh, at some point very soon. Thank you, everybody, for watching and listening. And I hope you enjoyed it. I did. And thanks, Jeff, for sharing all this. And can't wait to do it again for part two. You're welcome. And thank you. All right. Yeah, thanks, everyone. I hope you had a great day. So get ready for part two because we're going to do that soon. We got to keep on a roll here. Have a great day, folks. Take care. Stay safe and healthy.